There we go. So friends, welcome to All Saints Sunday, All Saints Day being tomorrow. So we're going to celebrate that today. And one of the gifts of, of the way that we look at that, because obviously in the Catholic Church or even the Episcopal Church, the, uh, the understanding of who is a saint and who is not is different than for Protestants who uh, will use the word saint as sort of a generic for those who have died and gone beyond, who were part of the church and now, you know, we're part of the church visible and now are part of the church triumphant, as we say. So that's where we are today, remembering the communion of the saints. And so we're going to have communion today. So um, make sure you've gathered something to eat and something to drink for when we get to that part of the service. We will also be remembering the saints. And I've got some slides with names and some with, with pictures that some of you have submitted in advance, but fear not if you want to add names to that list, we will uh, do that as an interactive part of the service on Zoom as well. So that's coming up. Also part of today's service is that we have video from the wider church. The main conference recently had its annual meeting. And as part of that, a uh, worship service was produced basically designed as a complete worship service to be used today. It could be used anytime. Um, we're not using the entire service, but I wanted to use as many parts and bits of it as possible. And so uh, you will see folks from other churches here, singers from other churches of the main conference. Um, our prayers today actually will be brought to us by uh, one of the staff people of the, I said mass, didn't I? I, I it's a bad habit. I, it, it, it's that conference I was in for so long. It, the main conference, it's an M in a conference. I get it, I get it mixed up. But um, yeah, so the, so the main conference will be present. Our staff person will be leading us in the prayers and all of that's recorded and um, will be, um, be included today. So we'll be celebrating our connection with, with the saints who are alive and part of the visible church and are beyond our congregation, as well as those who are beyond the veil and have gone beyond this life. So that's the theme for today as we enter into this. And um, next week, our theme will be stewardship. And we've been asking for people to provide stewardship minutes, and we've gotten uh, no volunteers other than crickets. So um, what I intend to do next week as part of the service is at some point open up the uh, the chat room and, and you know the Zoom room, you unmute yourselves, and there we can share impromptu our uh, and live our comments about what makes this congregation important to us individually. And uh, so, if you do have something that you like to share and you're comfortable sharing that next week as part of the worship service, know that that will be coming up in case you want to be prepared. And then finally, um, in a few weeks, it will be Thanksgiving. I know it's hard to accept already that that's the case, but it is true. And uh, so um, for that, I, I'm trying to gather videos. There's going to be a, the Interfaith Council of Waterville is doing a online worship service that will be a video that can be shared. And as part of that, I'm gathering a sort of person on the street, first person interviews, simply asking the question, what are you grateful for? So don't be surprised if I'm uh, tracking uh, many of you down to get you to answer that question, because I will be using uh, some of that material, the stuff from our church, primarily for our worship service that Sunday, uh, and some from our church, along with people from the community for the one for the community that's happening that week as well. So just heads up about what's coming up. So let me start the slides. Oh, not what I wanted to do. Uh-oh. Blame it on the spirits. Yep, sorry <laughs> about that. Let me get this right. So friends, seeking to walk in the way of Jesus, we are an open and affirming church, faithfully using who we are and what we have to serve those on the margins of our community. No matter who you are, 
or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Remember me. You who carry broken and brittle spirits, come and soak in the spring of renewal. You who are thirsting for justice in an unjust world, come and drink from the spring of restoration. You who are wrung out from grief and uncertainty, come and wash in the spring of peace. Come, be refreshed be restored, for God is here even now, even in this place. Let us pray. Spirit of love, refresh our hearts. Spirit of hope, renew our minds. Spirit of justice, restore our world. May our worship fill us with your love and transform us into springs of compassion and grace in our communities and our world. Amen.
Our story today is The Rough Patch by Brian, I suppose it's Lies. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Evan and his dog did everything together. They played games and enjoyed sweet treats. They shared music and adventures. They were together all through the day and through all the seasons. But what they loved the most was working in Evan's magnificent garden. There, everything they planted grew as big and as beautiful as the sky above them. But one day, the unthinkable happened. Evan laid his dog to rest in a corner of the garden and nothing was the same. Evan shut himself away inside. Without his best friend, the garden was a bitter and lonely place. One morning, he found himself with a hoe in his paws. Swinging angrily, he slashed the garden to the ground. He hacked it all to bits and threw everything into a heap. But a good place won't stay empty for long. New plants sprouted and stretched toward the sky. Weeds, itchy ones, spiky and prickly ones, foul-smelling ones. These weeds suited Evan just fine, so he took care of them. If Evan's garden couldn't be a happy place, then it was going to be the saddest and most desolate spot he could make it. And soon it was. When Evan found a pumpkin vine sneaking in under the fence, he raised his hoe to chop it. But then he considered its prickly stems, fuzzy leaves, and spidery, twisty tendrils. He let it be. As the pumpkin vine grew, Evan cleared the weeds from its path and watered it. The vine responded to his care. Around the time the evening air began to cool, Evan felt an old familiar sense of excitement. It was fair week. He loaded up the pumpkin and drove to town. He took care of important fair business and gobbled down some delicious fair food. He caught up with some friends too. It felt good to be out again, even if it wasn't quite the same. Evan's pumpkin won third place. Prize is $10 or one of the pups in that box, the judge said. I'll take the 10, said Evan.
But as he claimed his prize, he heard a scrabbling sound inside the box and thought it wouldn't hurt to just look. Thank you. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Revelations 21, 1 through 4 in the inclusive Bible. Then I saw new heavens and a new earth. The former heavens and the former earth had passed away, and the sea existed no longer. I also saw a new Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of the heaven from God, beautiful as a bride and groom on their wedding day. Then I heard a loud voice calling from the throne. Look, God's tabernacle, tabernacle is among humankind. God will be with them. They will be God's people, and God will be fully present among them. The Most High will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death Mourning, crying, and pain will be no more, for the old order has fallen. Friends, we know that like Evan in the story, when someone we love dies, nothing is the same. That's very true. Things change and are different. But I tell people who are experiencing loss when I'm counseling them in their grief that the person is gone, but not the relationship. The relationship simply changes. Anyone who's been in a long-term relationship knows what it's like to sense the other person's presence. Perhaps you might wake up in the morning and notice that the space beside you is empty and you feel like the person is there anyway. When I was in ministry in Salem, in the church where we had the shelter on the first floor and the sanctuary on the second, there was a man named Putnam who never felt worthy to come to church, which was a silly thought, but that was his thought. And so he was living in the shelter and we would close for Sunday, but he was frail and actually dying of cancer. And so we didn't make Putnam leave. And so we learned that Putnam would often sit right outside the door of the sanctuary and observe the service from there. Putnam died one, one Saturday night, just before service. And the next morning was when I discovered that and learned that fact. And that Sunday and many, many Sundays to come after that, I was certain that Putnam was sitting outside that door. And so we come to this table today to commune with all the saints. Perhaps you've been in a sanctuary that has a rail. There's an intention to that architecture, that semicircle that surrounds the front where we come to receive the gifts at the table is a semicircle intentionally because there's another half to that circle. And taking up the other half are those saints who've gone before us. And so we gather the saints now in this time and this place. We light a candle to remember, to stand witness to their presence among us.
we remember Martha Beach. We remember Sophie Mary Hedrick. We remember Mike Tremblay. We remember Hank Aaron. We remember Marshall Roy. We remember Carolyn Trask. We remember Everett L. and Lilla Davis Downing. We remember Dana P. and Caroline Hilton Sturdivant. We remember Ellen Hilton Savard. We remember Jean Mason. We remember Jane Lowell. We remember Alpheus and Muriel Sanford. We remember Bob Godfrey. And now if you have someone to name or perhaps some memory to share of one of these folks already named, raise your hand and uh, make sure you're unmuted and Laura will help by calling on you so that we're in order. State the name and I will ring the bell. Well, then, as the Saints, Nancy, got... excuse me, Nancy Sanford. Um, those were my parents, as you might have guessed. And um, that was that picture of them was on the um, beach at Harborside, uh, where uh, our cottages and where my parents had their honeymoon in 1947 and continued to go back and back years and years and years and took me with them when I came along. The place that we all um, love very much. I guess that's it. Reverend Mo, unmute yourself. Remembering my husband, Richard Osbrook, So friends, as we hear this beautiful anthem sung, let us feel the presence of those who've gone before us and also 
as we gather ourselves for our prayers, if there are joys and concerns that you would like to have shared, even if you share them with us um, unmuted after the anthem, please place them in the chat so that we'll all have that as a record for our prayers.
So what are the joys and concerns that you want to share by unmuting yourself and speaking them to the congregation? Continuing prayers for the hungry and the homeless. Prayers for all those displaced from the hotels in Augusta and needing shelter now. I see from the chat that uh, Michael wasn't able to get us uh, the names or put the names of, of the ones he's asking us to remember in the chat. And so we remember Hel Harold and Phyllis CV. Nick and Blanche Nichols. Linda CV Thomas and Jill Nichols Everett. My prayers are for the people last night who were outside and had no shelter. Friends, our God hears all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken. God is near. God is very near. God is as close as each breath that we take. Those whom we love, who are not in, any longer in this world, are with us. Those whom we don't know who are suffering are also quite near, and certainly near and dear to the heart of God. And so let us take a few moments of silence during which we will listen for our God to hear what the responses are to the prayers that we offer and to hear God's call to be part of the response. Let us pray. Please join for the prayers of intercession. God of the prophets, when the people cried for your help, you answered, here am I. Draw near again, O God, and receive the prayers of your people once more. In the season when we remember the saints of the church, we grieve the deaths of Peter Mercer, Carly Byer, and Harry Conroy pastors who served across the main conference. We grieve the closing of First Congregational UCC of Callis, Poland Community Church UCC, and First Congregational Church of Holton UCC. We give thanks for their ministries in the main conference and for the way they modeled faithful discipleship. We give thanks for the ministries in the main conference and for the way they model faithful discipleship. We pray for all of the saints of our church and for all the saints we have known who have nurtured and watered our faith and modeled your love and justice in the world. 
We grieve those who have died from COVID-19. We grieve the mental and emotional cost of isolation and distance. We grieve with those who lost jobs, homes, businesses, and hope in the midst of this pandemic. We give thanks for healthcare workers, teachers, for delivery drivers and grocery store workers, for all those people who continue to provide care, service, and support in the midst of uncertainty. We give thanks for technology and for friendships that keep us connected to one another. We pray for compassion and creativity in our work to restore and rebuild what has been lost in this season of pandemic. We grieve with those who have been displaced by war and violence. We grieve with those who have been displaced by natural disasters and by climate change. We grieve the destruction of our planet and the pace of climate change. We grieve the ways our fear prevents us from caring for one another the way that God cares for us. We give thanks for those who have answered the prophet's call to work on behalf of the hungry and the oppressed. We give thanks for all those who will not let us be content with peace without justice. We give thanks for those who engage in uncomfortable conversations that nudge us closer to God's shalom promised for all. We pray for courage in our work to do God's justice. We pray for hope for those still waiting for justice to be done. We grieve those wounds and concerns we hold closest to our hearts. We pray for ourselves and for our communities. We pray for God's healing waters to soothe and restore the tender places in our hearts and in our spirits. God of our beginnings and endings, we lift these and all of our prayers to you, confident that you dwell among us and ready to serve as instruments of healing and restoration in your world. We pray today and always using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Mother, God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your names. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Friends, as we come to the table, we bring our gifts. That is as it should be. And Jesus told us that if you are about to offer your gift and remember that a sibling has something against you, a neighbor, someone has a concern with you that you need to make that right first. And so with an attitude of confession, contrition, humility, we come to this table with our gifts. And we offer to God all of our gifts. So please make sure that you take that time to offer your financial gifts. Take that time to commit yourself in your time to service to others. And let us reflect on these our gifts and our offerings to God as we approach God's table.
So today is Halloween. Perhaps you've seen that some people are trying to make that a more Jesus-y day. Have you, have you seen that? The, the Jesus-ween? <laughs> um, and my reaction to that is that you've missed the message. Because Halloween is called Halloween because it's All Hallows Eve. Because the next day is All Saints Day. Now, granted, it was a Christian washing over or cleaning up of a pagan holiday. And so there are not really good roots to this. It doesn't reflect well on the church because the church was trying to sort of take over the pagan cultures and uh, where they couldn't wipe out the, the shamans and the medicine men and women and the, uh, the practices of the pagan cultures. They just sort of adopted them as Christian. You see, in the Celtic lands, there's a day on that falls now uh, that's called Samhain. It's the marking of the new year. And the belief is that at Samhain, the veil between this world and the next is at its thinnest, that this is a liminal space, a thin place where folks from the other side can pass back through. Thus, all the trick-or-treat traditions, right? The, the jack-o'-lanterns are carved to help sort of scare off and keep away the, the people from the other side. I guess, I guess after you've died, you're not that clever. You get distracted by uh, a carved out gourd with a light and you think it's a person and you interact with them instead. Uh, and of course, the people who have died this past year may have a, a grievance with you, might have a, a beef. And if they do, then they're going to come and trick you which is what the treats are for, to appease those folks. So the message is be good to everyone so that at Samhain, you're not facing those ghosts and goblins who are coming back to get you. Well, the church saw that practice and could not deny the truth that we are in relationship with those who've gone before us, that the veil between this world and the next is rather thin. Very often it is. And certainly when we've experienced loss, we continue to have relationships with others. So what the church did was it took the next day and made it a catch-all day for all the saints who didn't have their own feast day. And interestingly enough, a feast day of a saint is not on their birthday. I know it's more our practice to celebrate a person's life on the remembrance of their birth. Well, if you think about record keeping in the ancient world, knowing that someone was born on a certain day and having that record kept was pretty sketchy. But once a person was notable and famous, noticing their death was something that the public could mark. It was a public event. And so it was death days that became feast days for the saints. So it seemed appropriate that at this time of remembering those who have died, that all those saints that didn't have a particular day would be remembered on November 1st, the day after. Thus, this is All Hallows' Eve, and that is All Saints' Day. There's also a tradition of the following day, November 2nd, being All Souls' Day, because indeed all souls are to be remembered. And that's what we come to this table to do to celebrate, as the scripture tells us, the new heaven and the new earth. For you see, we have ideas about what heaven is like. Most of it is popular imagination. Not a whole lot of it is in scripture. We don't really know what's next, but we all have a sense that there is more. The famous scientist Jane Goodall, who is known for her work with the chimpanzees and the, the apes is getting older now. And she's done so much remarkable in her life. And just a couple of years ago, was asked a question before an audience about what her next great adventure will be. And her answer was death. Death because it is an adventure because either we die and that's it, and nothing happens, and she'll find that out when it happens, or something happens and it is a great adventure. I was recently visiting with a friend who is a hospice chaplain, 
and she was telling us stories of people she's worked with and how often people near death have a hope and a vision even though they can't name what's next. And some people who have never believed in God are not about to begin believing in God, but even they tend to say that they know that there is more. There is more. And I can't tell you what it is because I don't know. I haven't been there. But a few things I know about the promises of Scripture. We read this passage in Revelation about the new heaven and the new earth. And it is remarkable to me that so many Christians, especially in the recent experience of Western Christianity, have focused on the book of Revelation as this end time prophecy where all the terrible things are happening. And they think about these terrible things. And we talk about the mark of the beast, the seven-headed monster. Now, if I were to tell you a story, and I used as an example this, this monster tale where there is a giant donkey who has superpowers kicking and is fighting a mammoth elephant that shoots lasers from its eyes, you, you would probably understand that the story I'm telling you is a struggle between Republicans and Democrats, because we get the metaphor, we get the image, right? Well, trust me, the people who first read the book of Revelation understood that the seven-headed monster represented the seven hills of Rome, that they were talking about the Roman emperor. The suffering and the persecution that is described in the book of, Genesis, the book of Revelation was happening during the time of the people who were reading it. It was written in a way to keep John's head attached to his shoulders, <laughs> because if he were criticizing the empire directly, he would not have lived. As it was, he was exiled to an island. So we understand that he's writing to people who were persecuted. And scholars for centuries, the Christian church for a long, long time has read Revelation that way, not as it's been read recently with the uh, rapture and left behind and the end of the world visions. So what is being said there? What's being said are words of comfort, words that all of this is going on around you. The battle's already won. And the winner of the battle is the lamb. And everyone understood that to be Christ, the one who was slaughtered. That in his life-giving sacrifice, he was raised and placed on the throne. And this was to bring comfort, not for some future time, but for the very present in which the people were suffering. Very consistent with Jesus's message that the kingdom of heaven, that the reign of heaven, that the reign of God, that God's presence and realm is at hand. It's here and now, if you have eyes to see it and ears to hear it. And here in Revelation, John is saying that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It comes to us. Heaven is here, a new heaven. This earth is new if we see it that way, if we are filled with that sort of hope. And even if we can't, even if we struggle to find that comfort, the next passage, the next verse tells us the most important truth, that God is going to wipe away every tear, that there will be no more grief, no more mourning. That's a glorious promise. That's something we can hold on to. And we don't have to wait because John also tells us that God is dwelling among the people. That God's not living in the new heaven. God's living in the new earth. And the truth is, God is always living on this earth. If we have eyes to see the new earth breaking in. Jesus. At the table with his friends. remembered the story, the story of God's liberation of the people. And there was death and suffering then. Passover was about not dying, being passed over by the angel of death. And so it's remembered in, in that bread that wasn't allowed to rise because it was needed for the quick escape out of Egypt. Everyone around the table understood that story. And Jesus 
changed the story that night, added to it, interpreted it, said, you know this, now know this, that this is my body. And it is broken for you. For you see, brokenness is a vital piece of the story. Jesus knew that. Jesus had been praying in the garden that the cup would be taken away. But he knew that it couldn't. He knew that he must drink deeply of it. He must allow himself to be broken. And friends, whatever happens in the next world, whatever resurrection looks like, it looks like this life. Remember that Jesus, after his resurrection, when he appeared to Mary in the garden, was somehow transformed because she doesn't see him. But when he speaks her name, when he says Mary, she says, my teacher. She knows him in the relationship which never dies, which cannot die because love cannot die. It cannot be conquered. So whatever heaven is, is a continuation of loving relationships we have known in this existence. Remember also that Jesus appeared to Thomas and showed him his wounds. Jesus's resurrected body continued to be a disabled body, a body bearing the scars of this life, not put aside and forgotten, but remembered and carried forward, just like we remember the breaking of the bread. Just like we remember the pouring of the cup. Remembering that in blood, there is life. So that when bread, so that when blood is poured out, life is poured out. And Jesus said that he was about to pour out his life so that we might know a new covenant, a new communion with God and with one another. Because this covenant is a covenant of grace and forgiveness. Friends, we are a forgiven people. And thus we are blessed. And thus we have consecrated our gifts. The gifts that we give financially, the gifts that we give of our time, and the gifts that we bring to this table are all holy. They're holy because of our intention to see them as that, because our eyes see the kingdom of God and our ears hear the realm of heaven in this time, in this place, as we commune with one another and with the saints of all times and all places. So this table is here for us and for all as we gather and take this food and partake in the feast. Friends, let us partake. Oh God, we thank you for filling us with joy at your table, for empowering us to go forward and sharing with us your presence and reminding us of the presence of all the saints. Amen.
So my friends, go out from this place, this time, knowing you're not alone. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses so that you might lay aside every encumbrance and run the race that is set before you. And in doing that, give glory to God, the creator, this creator God who knows even the sparrow that falls. May God lift you on gentle breezes that you might soar with eagles and bless you with the gift of vision and give glory to the Christ who comes to you in so many ways and so many times among the least, the last, and the lost. May the Christ bless you with the gift of tears to shed with all who weep and give glory to God's wild, untamed Holy Spirit, wild as any wild goose. May this wild goose spirit of our God lead you into places where you wouldn't go on your own and bless you with a touch of foolishness that you might believe that God is with you and leading you. And may the love of God be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom you've lost and all those whom none but God loves. Now and until that day of God's judgment, when justice will roll down like waters and peace will blossom among all the peoples. Amen. <laughs>